The Battle of Hlobani was a forgotten British disaster during the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879. Once more, a combination of Zulu excellence and British mistakes led to a costly defeat on a lonely mountain in South Africa. In what was supposed to be a diversionary attack on a mountain to steal Zulu cattle and neuter local Zulu resistance, the British found themselves instead surrounded by the main Zulu army, and their force was nearly wiped out. As it was, they lost 90 men killed from their force of 400 colonial troops, plus well over 100 African auxiliaries and Zulu allies. Only a victory over that same Zulu army the following day, and some careful massaging of the information by the commander, Sir Evelyn Wood, moved the Battle of Khabani from another headline, and maybe a film, to a footnote that only Zulu war buffs know about. The early stages of the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879 hadn't gone quite the way the British commander, Lord Chelmsford, had expected. The Zulus had proved themselves far worthier adversaries than the British had given them credit. Many followers of military history will be aware that the British army was decisively defeated at the Battle of Isandwana. The Zulus overran the camp, wiping out most of the 1,300 British defenders. But Isandwana was not the only Zulu success. Chelmsford had invaded the Zulu kingdom in a three-pronged attack. His own column, Sir Evelyn Wood's number four column to the north, and Colonel Pearson's column attacking close to the coast. We all know about the disaster that befell the central column at Isandwana, but it got worse. The coastal column had ended up being besieged at Eshoe. And meanwhile, to the northwest, the British 80th Regiment of Foot had lost 70 men when their camp at Intombe was overrun by the Zulus under a Swazi prince, Bellini. So all in all, the British invasion had been a bit of a disaster, and Chelmsford needed to both reverse the military situation and save British honour. Welcome to another talk on one of my most popular subjects here on YouTube, the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879. It's certainly a period from British military history that has fascinated me ever since my dad took me to see Zulu when I was a lad. Yet the arrival of the Zulu army above Rourke's Drift is still one of my favourite cinematic moments. What is it about this war that fascinates you? I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below. Now, today's story is another cracker, although pretty much forgotten. Bravery, edge of your seats action, incompetence, and more. I think it'd actually make a fantastic film. So sit back, grab your favourite drink, and let me tell you the story of the Battle of Hlobani. Having retraced his steps back into the British colony of Natal, Lord Chelmsford decided to extricate the coastal column under Colonel Pearson from their position at Eshoe. The problem for Chelmsford was that the Zulu king, Keshweo, could now throw his victorious army at Chelmsford as he made his way to relieve Pearson. And thus, on the 20th of March, he ordered Colonel Evelyn Wood and his fourth column in the northwest of Zululand to create a diversion and draw some of Keshweo's army to the opposite end of the kingdom. After all, even Zulus couldn't be in two places at once. And Sir Evelyn and his deputy, Colonel Reedvers Buller, were more than happy to oblige. The only problem for Wood and Buller was that despite offering themselves as bait, they hadn't actually prepared themselves for the coming storm. And so it was that on the 28th of March 1879, the British came within a hair's breadth of another calamitous defeat at the hands of the Zulus. The backbone to Wood's number four column were two battalions of regular British troops, also called Imperial troops, the 13th Somerset Regiment of Foot, also called Prince Albert's Light Infantry, and the 90th Perthshire Light Infantry, comprising of about 1,200 troops in total. The rest of his force was made up of around 500 mounted colonial troops, 500 black African auxiliaries, and a couple of hundred renegade Zulus, commanded by King Keshweo's half-brother, Prince Hamu. Sir Evelyn Wood and Colonel Buller were both members of Sir Garnet Wolseley's Ashanti Ring of Officers. Wood, who'd been awarded the Victoria Cross during the Indian Mutiny, Indian Revolt in the 1850s, during which time he had survived being trampled by a giraffe, was keen to take the war to the Zulus. Indeed, he was so keen to be in action that he had actually advanced his number four column across the border before the British ultimatum had expired. Moving forward to establish a fortified position at Kambula, it was there that he heard the incredible news of the British defeat at Isandwana. Since that defeat, Wood had stayed put at Kambula, which he had fortified using wagons and trenches. Now with Chelmsford ordering him to create a diversion, 
he activated a plan that he and Bulla had been formulating for several weeks. They would attack the Abu Kuluzi Zulus, who were deeply loyal to the Zulu king, at their stronghold of Khabani Mountain, about 25 miles northeast of his encampment at Kambula. The Abu Kuluzi had been joined by Imbalini, the victor at Intombi, and had placed 1,000 warriors guarding 2,000 cattle on the top of the mountain. Despite what some viewers comment about the British wanting Zulu gold, there was no gold in Zululand. The key to Zulu wealth was cattle. To lose 2,000 of them on Khobani Mountain would be a psychological blow to a society that valued cattle above all else, and it would also deny Keshweo's army a valuable food source. Khobani Mountain, with its flat top, was about four miles long and about half a mile wide. It was part of a chain of mountains running in a northeasterly direction towards the neighbouring kingdom of the Swazis. Rising to nearly 1,000 feet above the surrounding plains with sheer sides, except at each end, it was a natural defensive position, with enough room for all those cattle as well. To the northeast end, a saddle or neck linked it to the next mountain, Inyentika. At the other end, it dropped to a lower plateau via a 150 foot steep slope, later called Devil's Pass, and you'll find out why it has that name in a little while. That lower plateau, called Little Khobani or Nintendika, broadened into a four mile ridge before rising to the Zunguin mountain. Wood had actually conducted a reconnaissance on the 15th of March and had identified two possible routes to the summit of Khobani. However, as he was viewing from distance, and no one in his force had ever climbed the mountain, his survey was far from accurate. His observations had failed to clearly identify the routes in detail, nor had they spotted the myriad of caves that honeycombed the mountain, and nor had he actually seen just how steep that Devil's Pass actually was. Moreover, whilst the top of the mountain looked flat from his distant reconnaissance, he was unsure whether it contained gullies or other natural obstacles that could both hinder his advance and aid the Zulu defenders. From his observations, however, Wood had spotted that the bulk of the 1,000 Zulu warriors, and no doubt therefore the cattle, were on that lower plateau of Little Khobani. He therefore decided to cut them off from retreating to the higher mountain by sending Colonel Buller to seize Khobani itself in a nighttime advance. The next morning, a second force would advance along the four mile ridge towards the lower plateau, thus catching the Zulus in a pincer movement. In the early hours of the 27th of March, 1879, whilst it was still dark, his attack force was assembled. As Khobani was 25 miles away, Wood decided not to use his British infantry, the 13th and the 90th. This would be a mounted colonial expedition, along with African infantry, who were more used to traversing this landscape at speed. As mentioned just now, Wood planned a pincer attack. Buller would scale Khobani from the furthest end of the mountain, with 400 mounted colonial troops. The largest contingent were just over 150 members of the Frontier Light Horse, under the command of Captain Robert Barton, on secondment from the Coldstream Guards. The other colonial volunteer troops were the Transvaal Rangers, under Commandant Peter Johannes Raff, and 80 men from the Cape Colony, in a unit called Baker's Horse. There were also about 30 local Boers, riding under Bulla, under the command of Peter Ace, the 52-year-old son of one of the four trekkers' leaders from the Great Trek. Finishing off Buller's force were just under 300 local Africans from Wood's irregular battalion. They were commanded by Major Knox Leet from the 13th Regiment of Foot. The only Imperial, or British regulars, in Buller's column were eight men from the Royal Artillery Rocket Company. Meanwhile, Lieutenant John Cecil Russell would lead the second prong of the attack, up onto the plateau, driving the Abakuluzi Zulus and their cattle before them into the arms of Buller. Russell was a 40-year-old cavalry officer who had served in the Ashanti War, and whilst he never reached the stardom of some of his compatriots, he was thus also a member of Garnet Wolseley's Ashanti Ring. So, interestingly, this means that the overall mastermind of the Battle of Khobani Mountain and the commanders of both attacking forces were all Ashanti Ring members, Wood, Buller and Russell. Russell's force was slightly smaller than Buller's, consisting of about 640 men in total of whom just under 200 were mounted. There were about 80 men from the mounted infantry, under the command of Lieutenant Edward Brown, from the 1st Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot. As he'd been seconded away from the 24th, his mounted infantry were with Chelmsford when he split his forces at Isandwana, and thanks to this secondment, he'd been saved from being at the camp 
when five companies of his battalion were wiped out. There was also a smaller contingent called the Caffarian Vanguard from the Cape Colony, and completing the mounted contingent were about 70 men from the Edendale contingent from the Natal native horse. Many of these highly regarded black soldiers had fought alongside Colonel Durnford at his Andwana before escaping a long fugitive's drift and providing a brief screen at the very beginning at the Battle of Rourke's Drift. Once again, there were over 200 men from Woods Irregulars, but Russell was also accompanied by 200 disaffected Zulus. These warriors were loyal to King Keshweo's half-brother, Hamu. Traditionally sympathetic to the British, and maybe with an eye on the throne, he had thrown in his lot with Colonel Evelyn Wood at the outset of the war. Once more, the only Imperial troops involved were another rocket battery from the Royal Artillery. Buller's force, which had further to travel, set off first. It was a hot, sunny day as Buller moved south, skirting both Little Holbani and the larger mountain. The only sign of life up on the mountain were three large signal fires the Zulus had lit. Clearly who they were signalling to was not clear, and Buller didn't seem to care or worry. And that, when dealing with the Zulus, always tended to spell disaster. And so it would, very, very soon. By about 3pm, he'd moved beyond Klobani and in an effort to disguise his true intentions, made a very visible display of establishing a camp. With fires burning, his men sat down to drink a well-earned coffee. They were now about five miles south of Klobani, 30 miles from the safety of the entrenched British position at Kambula. The Zulus, however, were not fooled and had started moving cattle and men onto the higher mountain, and there they waited for the inevitable attack. Not only did they believe that Buller would inevitably turn back to the mountain, but they correctly guessed that he would ascend using the trail at the far northeastern end. As darkness fell, Buller ordered his men to stoke up the fires, and then silently they moved forward. Evelyn Wood was riding through the night with a small escort towards Buller's now deserted camp to watch the attack at dawn. En route, he'd picked up Prince Hamu and some of his men from Russell's column. Suddenly he saw movement ahead, but it wasn't Zulus. Through the gloom appeared about 60 mounted men of the boarded horse. This unit, made up of mainly British settlers from the Transvaal, had been established by Lieutenant Colonel Frederick Weatherly, a 51-year-old Canadian. As a young man, he had served in the Austrian cavalry before obtaining a commission in the 4th Light Dragoons, and he had, with that regiment, ridden at the charge of the Light Brigade during the Crimean War. After further service during the Great Revolt in India, he'd left the army under something of a cloud and settled in South Africa. Controversy continued to stalk Weatherly when he divorced his wife shortly before the outbreak of the Anglo-Zulu War, and he'd brought his teenage sons with him on campaign. He'd set out slightly later in the day to join Buller's force, but had, in the dark, got lost. He was not a man whom Wood warmed to, seeing him as a rather flamboyant character. And now, he was not best pleased to find him five miles south of the mountain. He was even less impressed with the news that Weatherly imparted. Stumbling around in the dark, slightly further to the south of where they now were, he had come across a Zulu army fast asleep. Now, whilst aware that the Zulu king might very well send his army towards him in response to this diversion operation, Wood scoffed at the information. Nonsense, he snapped. I've had my men out yesterday. There is no Zulu impi. Weatherly's second in command, Captain Dennison, interrupted and said that he'd crept right up to the camp. Again, the commander repeated his assertion. Dennison must be mistaken. But he was not mistaken. There was a Zulu army, fast asleep, just a few miles away. It had been dispatched from the Zulu capital on the 24th of March and had covered the 70 miles distance in three days. And in the morning, it would be heading right this way. Buller's advance towards the neck that separated Klobani from Inyantika had initially proceeded well. But sometime around midnight, a storm had descended on the area. Sheets of rain deluged the advancing troops, and men and horses were sent skidding across the rocky surface. Huge flashes of lightning cracked across the sky, and that lightning illuminated Buller's men to the Zulu guards above. Suddenly shots rang out. Lieutenant Williams and three others were killed. As dawn started to break, the storm finally stopped. But still, Buller's men had to contend with making their way up the slippery gradient while Zulus took potshots at them from almost invisible caves just below the ridge. 
In the growing light, Sir Evelyn Wood was also riding forwards towards the base of the neck, and with him was Weatherly with his border horse. If he was concerned about the report of a Zulu army, Wood didn't seem to show it. He was more concerned with the lack of enthusiasm the border force was showing to follow Buller up the slopes and face the enemy. In frustration, he rode past the stationary colonials with his escort, but promptly found the track he was following ended in a dead end. As Wood was about to retrace his steps, a shot rang out from a cave about 50 yards away, and his political officer, Llewellyn Lloyd, fell from his horse with a bullet in his spine. He died almost immediately. Wood now ordered his escort to take out the sniper in the cave. Captain Ronald Campbell, on secondment from the prestigious Coldstream Guards, led a small party upwards. The gap into the cave was only about two feet wide, so that the party had to assault it in single file. As Campbell charged into the entrance, he was shot straight through the forehead. Lieutenant Lissons and Private Fowler followed behind, leaping over Campbell's prone body into the narrow gap, and entered the dark cave, finally hunting the sniper down and killing him. Wood ordered that both Lloyd and Campbell should be buried on the mountain. While some of Hummel's warriors dug the graves with their assegais, he ordered his bugler, Alexander Walkinshaw, to go back to his horse to fetch a Bible so that he could conduct a hasty funeral. Despite the continuing sniper fire from above, Walkinshaw calmly made his way down the slope to the horse and then returned in a similar leisurely and upright manner. For this action, he would receive the Distinguished Conduct Medal. Having conducted his funeral service, Wood now remounted and decided to make his way back along the south side of Klobani Mountain to see how Russell was progressing. Actually, Russell had been making pretty good and easy progress, ascending the long four mile wide slope that led up to the southwestern end of Little Klobani. All the easier as he found no Zulus, as they'd all moved to the higher ground, which Buller was trying to occupy. Meanwhile, four miles away, Buller's force had reached the neck and turning left, had finally crested the northeastern ridge of the main Klobani mountain. The Zulu defenders had disappeared into the caves and gullies that littered the plateau, and his force gingerly made their way forward. If the colonials were worried about the dangers lurking on the mountain, the African irregulars had thrown caution to the wind as they gleefully rounded up hundreds of cattle that were roaming on the plateau. Buller became aware that the Zulus had used the terrain to move behind his force, and ordered A Troop of the Frontier Light Horse to cover his rear and keep the Zulus at bay, whilst he herded both the 2,000 cattle and his men down onto the lower plateau to join Russell. But Buller's plan was about to go horribly wrong, and not due to one, but two reasons. Firstly, the descent down from Klobani onto the plateau was not quite as simple as Wood's reconnaissance a few days beforehand had implied. Rather than a gentle descent, Buller was confronted with a 150-foot near-vertical drop littered with rocks and boulders. Whilst a man might with some difficulty lead a horse down it, it would almost be impossible for a man to descend actually mounted or at speed. Which leads us to the second reason why Buller's plan was about to go horribly wrong. He was going to need to get off this mountain fast. Colonel Sir Evelyn Wood was making his way along a ridge on the lower slopes on the south side of Klobani Mountain. Around him, Prince Hamu's followers herded some goats that they'd captured. Suddenly, the Zulu prince called Wood to the edge of the ridge. The British commander trotted over and looked down onto the plain below. Sweeping along the side of the mountain was the main Zulu army. Yep, the one he'd scoffed was nowhere near here. Over 20,000 strong. The heads of those warriors, many of whom had been victorious at Isanguana, would turn towards the firing that they could hear from Buller's men, somewhere out of sight on the top of the mountain. As Wood watched on, the Zulu army started to adopt its traditional Horns of the Buffalo battle formation. The flanking horns were already starting to increase pace as they sought to climb up the track that Buller had taken only a few hours before, and the other raced southwestwards to either the scale of the neck between Little Khobani and Zunguen mountain, or indeed sweep around that mountain entirely. Either way, they would cut off a retreat to Kambula. Suddenly, Wood's diversionary action was in danger of becoming a repeat of his Handwana. He hurriedly wrote a note to Russell, warning him of the danger. He then ordered his men to ride or run as fast as they could along the ridge and get ahead of the Zulu army. It was now 10.30am on the 28th of March, 1879. By the time Wood's note reached Russell, he had already seen the Zulu army. Aware that there was no way that Buller could descend the 150-foot precipitous drop, 
Hitz sent two officers climbing up to find his counterpart and advised that he would need to descend the way that he had arrived. Now upon seeing the Zulus to the south, he sent a further message warning Buller of the danger. It was now that Wood's message arrived, ordering him to get into a position on Zunguin neck. Whilst Russell was more than happy to get off the plateau and avoid a similar fate to the defenders of Isandwana, the message perplexed him. A neck is normally, in this part of Africa, a narrow piece of land or saddle connecting two mountains. But as far as he could see, the plateau that he was on rolled southwestwards for several miles before gently rising to Zunguin Mountain. So, was he on the neck now? Or was his commanding officer talking about the neck on the far side of Zunguin, which made sense if the Zulu horn was trying to pass around that mountain and close the escape route to Kambula? Russell decided that Wood meant the latter and ordered his men to vacate Little Khobani. And by doing so, he left Bulla on his own. Meanwhile, up on the mountain, Bulla was suddenly becoming aware of how dire the situation was. At the same time that Wood was scribbling his warning and order to Russell, Buller, still oblivious to the impending danger, had ordered Captain Barton and a contingent from the Frontier Light Horse to head back across the mountain to bury Lieutenant Williams and the three others killed on the climb that morning. Now, just a half an hour later, at 11am, he received Russell's warning. Already he could see up on Inyentika Mountain over 2,000 Zulus gathering under Imbellini. Barton, totally unawares, was riding straight towards them. He was also riding straight towards the right horn of the Zulu army. Frantically, he sent two troopers riding across the broken ground with a new message. Retreat by the right of the mountain. If Wood's message to Russell had been vague and confusing, it was rivalled by Buller's to Barton. In a rerun of the messages ordering the charge of the Light Brigade, it was a message that had different interpretations depending where you were physically standing and looking. Buller had dictated the note whilst facing west. To him, the right of the mountain was the western or northwestern edge, in other words, the side closer to the safety of Kambula. Unfortunately, it just so happened that when Captain Barton received the message, he was at the far end of the mountain, about to descend onto the neck between Klobani and Inyantika, facing east. As he looked out, his right was along the southern edge of the mountain, from where Buller had approached the day before. He duly descended the path, meeting Weatherly en route, whose men swelled his ranks. As their force of just over 100 men came towards the base of the neck, they saw to their horror the right horn of the Zulu army, just a quarter of a mile away, and advancing straight towards them. Barton and Weatherly hurriedly turned their men around to once more ascend to the neck, only to find that Umbellini and over 2,000 men, both from his clan, along with the local Abu Kaluzi, were now blocking their path. They were trapped. Behind them, the rapidly advancing Zulu army. Ahead of them, in that narrow neck, filled with 2,000 warriors. But beyond the neck was the route back to Kambula. They charged into the Zulus above them, and as they disappeared into the waiting throng, it was every man for himself. Some did manage to break through, and now a further horror awaited them. The other side of the neck, or saddle, ended with a 400-foot precipice strewn with rocks. As the survivors hesitated, the Zulus were amongst them, shooting, stabbing. Lieutenant Colonel Weatherly turned and saw his 15-year-old son, Rupert, on the ground, with the Zulu towering above him, Asagai raised. The veteran of the charge of the Light Brigade spurred his horse, and killing the Zulu, he grabbed his injured son. The man who had warned Woods about the Zulu army was last seen wielding his sabre and clutching his son, as the Zulus swarmed around him. They were among 66 colonial troops to die on the neck. Those who survived did so by plunging their horses down the precipice. Amongst them was Captain Dennison, whose claim that he had crept up to the sleeping Zulu army had been ridiculed by Wood. He was the only officer of the border horse to survive the Battle of Hobani, and would go on to serve in both the First and Second Boer Wars. Another man to break through the Zulus was Captain Barton. Barton lost his horse in the descent, but managed to find a riderless mount at the base. Nursing an Asagai wound, he rode towards safety, although safety was not close to hand. It might have been hard for mounted men to descend those rocks, but it had been easy for fleet-footed Zulus. Any colonial trooper without a horse was swiftly overtaken and killed. Barton came across another officer, Lieutenant Paul of the Border Horse, running for his life. Hoisting Paul onto his horse, he set off for Kambula, 
25 miles away, chased by Zulu warriors. And the Zulus wouldn't give up. They pursued him for eight miles. Finally, Barton's horse gave up, and the two men tried to run for it. Poole was killed, and then a senior warrior, an Induna, faced Barton. The British officer drew his revolver and fired. His revolver misfired. Again, another misfire. Third time lucky. Not this time. Another misfire. The Induna, who had already washed his spear by killing other soldiers up on the neck, indicated for Barton to surrender. Unbeknown to the Coldstream Guardsmen, the Zulu King had issued orders to capture British officers. As they faced each other, the silence was shattered by a rifle shot. Another Zulu warrior had arrived. The Induna looked back at Barton, who fell mortally wounded. Barton would not be his prisoner, so he stepped forward and delivered the coup de grace. Once the men of the Frontier Light Horse and the Border Horse were dying on the neck, the situation at the far end of Klobani Mountain was equally dire. Panic was setting in as the Natal Africans and the colonial troops found themselves trapped between the rocky 150-foot drop, later called Devil's Pass, and the Zulus advancing along the mountain top. Making matters worse, even if a man had wanted to take his chances descending that drop, he had to get past 2,000 panic-stricken cattle blocking the way. Behind them, the Zulus, who'd originally been keeping their distance, were emboldened by the arrival of the army, and their success down on the neck. They now started to dart in amongst Buller's milling force. It was with some difficulty that Buller restored a semblance of order and formed a rearguard to buy time for as many men as possible to descend the treacherous slope. For vital minute, Commandant Raff of the Transvaal Rangers, Lieutenant Brown of the Mounted Infantry, and Troop Sergeant Major Charles Everett commanded that rear guard. You might recall Lieutenant Brown. He had missed the fate of most of his battalion of the 24th Regiment at Disandwana because he'd been seconded to the Mounted Infantry. He'd started this expedition with Russell's column. So why was he now up there with Buller? Well, it seemed his luck had finally run out. He was one of the officers whom Russell had sent climbing Devil's Pass to warn Buller of the impending danger. As Brown and the rest of the rear guard fired away, Africans were seen running towards them, and a shout went up that they were part of Wood's irregular auxiliaries. They ceased fire. Too late, they realised that whoever had shouted that cease fire was wrong. They were Zulus, and they tore through that fragile line of defence. One officer and 16 troopers were killed. That stand on the mountain had brought valuable time for others to escape. But the remaining defenders up there were now finally being overwhelmed. Victoria Zulus were even throwing some of the defenders off the side of the mountain to their deaths. Trooper Pearson reached the edge of the ridge only to be speared from his horse by a Zulu. Trooper Whitecross came to his aid. He used his rifle butt to beat off the warrior, pulled Pearson onto his horse, and somehow he guided his horse, carrying two men, down that slope. Both men and the horse survived. Up on the edge of the mountain, Sergeant Major Everett knew it was all over. He sat down and simply awaited death. All at once, a large hand grabbed his collar and was rushing him towards the drop into Devil's Pass. Awaiting that final shove from the Zulu warrior, he suddenly realised it was in fact Colonel Buller who bellowed at him to climb down. Later survivors claimed that Buller was the last man to descend from the mountaintop. The descent down the rock face to Devil's Pass was just as frightening as anything up on the mountaintop. Men and horses were stumbling and falling. Horses lost their footing and fell onto troopers who lay trapped, Zulus leaping down to finish them off. 17-year-old George Mossop, nicknamed Chops, was born in Durban in 1861. When he was just 14, he'd run away from home and became a dispatch rider in the Transvaal. With over three years' experience riding across the African felt, he had, despite his age, been snapped up by the frontier light horse. Now he found himself on the edge of Klobani Mountain, looking down at the mayhem below. Nursing an assegai slash across his arm, he abandoned his horse and jumped off the ledge. Slipping down the precipice, passing dead horses and Zulus, he arrived at the bottom. And as he recovered his senses, he felt a giant hand on his shoulder. It was Bulla. Where's your horse? shouted the colonel from Devon. Mossop indicated back to the ridge. Go and get it and don't lose it again, roared Bulla. The teenager was so scared of Bulla that he actually climbed back up the slope where the few surviving defenders were facing the Zulus. Amazingly, there too was his pony, named Warrior. At that moment, the Zulus charged, and he and another man were chased to the southern edge of the mountain, away from Devil's Pass. Mossop asked if they could get away, and his companion said, not a chance. And with that, to Mossop's horror, 
he placed the barrel of his carbine in his mouth and pulled the trigger. That suicide, along with the advancing Zulus, galvanised the young trooper. He'd have to take his chances with the furious Buller. Once more he jumped off the edge and somehow bounced from rock to rock all the way down to a ridge below without breaking a limb. And there on the ridge, almost like a present from heaven, was none other than Warrior. He mounted his pony and galloped up the slope to Devil's Pass, dodging Zulu warriors and over the other side. George Mossop reached the safety of Kambula that night, but brave Warrior, who had sustained an Asagai wound in the escape, died the following morning. Mossop himself would continue to serve for the rest of the Anglo-Zulu War, finishing off at the Battle of Ulundi. He died in Rhodesia in 1938. Whilst he had been having his miraculous escape over the southern ridge of Klobani Mountain, the rest of the survivors had been fighting for their lives up on Devil's Pass. Zulus had bounded down the rock face and were now attacking men who were desperately trying to find mounts to escape on. Pete Ice, the Boer commander, saw his son struggling to control his horse and rode back to help him. As he neared, a Zulu suddenly sprung up and speared him in the back. Amazingly, Lieutenant Brown's luck continued to hold. He'd managed to get down from the mountain as the rear guard had broken. Having found a horse, he proceeded to carry two troopers to safety. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Smith of the Frontier Light Horse was also plucked to safety by Major Knox Leet riding past. Lieutenant Cecil Darcy found himself unseated in Devil's Pass. Trooper Francis raced towards him with a spare horse. Leaping up, Darcy was about to escape when he saw a wounded trooper nearby. Dismounting, he heaved the trooper up and slapped the horse which galloped away. For that act of selflessness, he'd be recommended for the Victoria Cross. As he now stood with the Zulus closing in, Darcy was rescued by Buller, who rode to his aid. As the day ended, exhausted survivors started to ride into the British camp at Kambula. Many had been chased for several miles by the Zulus. Upon his own arrival, Buller realised that some of the men he'd seen escaping westwards from Klobani had yet to return. Immediately saddling up, he went out into the dark, searching for them. And throughout that long night, he found survivors and shepherded them home. Five Victoria Crosses were awarded for acts of bravery during that chaotic and terrifying battle on Klobani Mountain. They were Lieutenant Brown of the 24th Regiment of Foot and Mounted Infantry for his bravery in rescuing two men at Devil's Pass. Major Knox Leet for rescuing Lieutenant Smith, again at Devil's Pass. Lieutenant Listens and Private Fowler for storming the cave after Captain Campbell had been killed. And finally Redford's Buller for three acts of bravery, rescuing Sergeant Major Everett, Trooper Randall and Lieutenant Darcy. Interestingly, Darcy was recommended for the VC by Buller for his brave actions giving up his horse for the wounded trooper, but the recommendation was turned down. However, with a certain element of poetic justice, he was awarded a VC for bravery just before the final battle of this war at Alundi, when he was commanding the Frontier Light Horse. And the man who recommended him on that occasion? <laughs> Redvers Buller, VC. Four Distinguished Conduct Medals were also awarded to survivors of the Battle of Klobani, including bugler Alexander Walkinshaw. He would remain with Wood for the rest of the war, and afterwards stayed with Wood when he escorted the Empress Eugenie of France to Zululand to visit the spot where her son, the Prince Imperial, was killed. Walkinshaw would end up falling in love and marrying one of the Empress's maids, and would die in France in the 1920s. But the medals for gallantry and the incredible acts of bravery and narrow escapes couldn't hide the fact that Klobani was almost a disaster of massive proportions. As it was, 10 officers and 80 men were killed out of Buller's force of 400 mounted colonial troops, nearly a quarter. The Frontier Light Horse had lost 29 men, and the Border Horse had almost ceased to exist as a unit. Over 100 African Irregulars and Hamu's warriors had also been killed. And rather like the recent defeat at Isangwana, a large part of the disaster was of the British own making. Scant reconnaissance meant that Devil's Pass came as a surprise to both Buller and Russell, who couldn't join forces. Careless or even negligent scouting had not spotted a Zulu army of over 20,000 approaching, and reports of the nearby army were dismissed by Wood as simply wrong. Incredibly, Colonel Evelyn Wood VC somehow came out smelling of roses. Partly this was down to him being deliberately vague in his reports about what had actually taken place. His massaged accounts left even his commander, Lord Chelmsford, unclear about what had exactly happened up there in northwest Zululand. But there was no denying the facts. 
Hot on the heels of Isangwana and Intombi, this was the third Zulu victory of this war. But this victory would also be their last. Just 24 hours later, that victorious army would be decisively defeated by Wood's British redcoats when they attacked his fortified position at Kambula. And therein lies one last reason why Hlobani didn't get the coverage of Isandwana. Put quite simply, no British redcoats had been involved at Hlobani. Apart from some officers attached to the various units, the battle had been fought by colonial white troops and black African auxiliaries. So, whilst many newspapers in South Africa were aghast at the casualties, the British press paid its scant attention. After all, colonial units being wiped out didn't sell newspapers in Britain, whereas a magnificent victory by the Redcoats just a day later was much more interesting. And that victory, the Battle of Kambula, would be the turning point of this war. And I'm going to cover it in another episode very soon. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed that story from the Anglo-Zulu War. What stories from British or British military history would you love to hear about in the future? Please do drop me a line in the comments section below. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe to my channel, and maybe even become a member. Click on the buttons below. Thanks for your support. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon. <laughs>